So in high school, biology was my favorite subject, but I didn't actually know about the human biology program at Stanford until I got the paperback version of the bulletin in the mail, and I was flipping through it, and I saw biology, and I saw human biology, and I saw all these classes that human biology had to offer, and they were so interesting and different than anything I'd ever thought of before. And so I sort of had an idea that I wanted to major in human biology as I entered um, freshman year, and then for one reason or another, I sort of began to think about other majors. And for a time, I wanted to major in linguistics. Um, and then through a series of, I guess, fortunate events, I went abroad to Tanzania over the summer between freshman and sophomore year. And I volunteered with Support for International Change, which is an NGO that teaches about HIV and AIDS in different rural villages in Tanzania. And I remember um, we had an orientation session and we were making a huge web of different aspects that we thought influenced HIV and HIV transmission in these communities. And it was a huge web and basically had so many different factors from um, basically like not knowing enough or um, not enough access to condoms or other materials that you would need. And um, a girl who I volunteered with was a human biology major and I could see that she was already beginning to synthesize this information together. And so I ultimately decided to major in human biology for this reason, that it combines both science and the social sciences. And um, in the end, I think it really does a, a great job of that. Okay, so um, I actually went into human biology thinking that I wanted to study infectious diseases and immunology. But um, winter quarter in 3A, we learned about cancer and developmental biology. And this actually began to really fascinate me. Um, and so I, I decided right then that I wanted to study cancer and developmental biology. And um, I also hadn't really been exposed to the field of research and science in general, and that was really interesting to me too, because in high school, we basically just learned facts, and you memorized these facts and took them for what they were. But part of the way of teaching in human biology was sort of through experiments and how certain what we know was discovered, and that was really interesting to me. So by the winter quarter of my sophomore year, I had decided to work in this oncology lab um, run by Dean Felsher. And um, I became interested in, in studying cancer because of what we had learned in the winter quarter of human, bio of human biology. And um, I actually um, applied for HB Rex and got it for that summer to work in Dean Felsher's laboratory. And that's when I really began to dive into the research in this lab. And he, um, his main, method of studying cancer is to use mouse models and basically there's different he has different tumors arising in different organs and they're all driven by a single oncogene and basically the really interesting fact is that you can remove this oncogene and the tumors will regress in most cases and this shows that these tumors are dependent on this oncogene and the oncogene not only initiates the cancer but helps to maintain it and so in talking to my postdoc in developing projects we sort of wanted to explore other therapeutic options for cancers. And I became interested in figuring out how um, a cancer cell's energy requirements could be used against its um, hyperproliferative needs. And um, we had a new mouse model of kidney cancer, and this was the model I'll be working on. And so we really began to explore um, how metabolism can influence and drive the cancer cells made, made, um primary activities, and then also if we remove this energy source, what would happen to it? And um, after HB Rex, I continued to work in the laboratory and completed my internship in the lab. And then um, I ended up doing my thesis in the lab too, which focused primarily on this glutamine aspect and also on the um, how the tumors regress when we remove MYC, the oncogene, from the kidney tumors. It's kind of it's really complicated because different tissues require different energy sources, for example, glucose or glutamine. And um, that's actually one of the main questions that would want, we would want to look at in terms of using metabolism as a therapeutic because you need to know which source the tissue depends on primarily in order to actually target it. If you target glucose when the t uh, tissue primarily needs gl glutamine, that's probably not going to work. Um, and so part of our main um, foray into metabolism, especially in these kidney tumors, was to determine 
whether they um, primarily needed glucose versus glutamine. And um, we sort of explored this idea with a variety of different experiments. And one of them, one of the first ones, was to take a cell line that we derived from the kidney tumors and to take media, which had, didn't have glutamine or glucose, and then supplement one, one group of cells with glucose and one with glutamine. And it turned out that these cells grew way, way better with the glutamine supplemented media. And so this was like the first indication that they probably needed glutamine over glucose for their energy and um, growth needs. And so from there, um, we went and did a couple of more experiments, including looking at gene expression of um, genes involved in glutamine metabolism versus glucose metabolism. And we just happened to find a kidney tumor that depends primarily on glutamine. But one of the issues is that different uh, tumor types depend on different energy sources. And um, what a really important study showed that different types of breast cancers have a differential, differential need for glucose versus glutamine. And so that's really the first step, I think, in determining whether metabolism as a therapy could be useful for a specific tumor. Every summer, either as a junior or a senior, you can do Bing Honors College through the Human Biology program. And if you're a junior, it sort of kickstarts you to think of, start thinking of honors thesis ideas. And if you're a senior, it helps you, it helps kickstart your year of writing your honors thesis. And so it basically brings together juniors, seniors, A side, B side concentrations. And you work together to develop the basic fundamental aspects of your thesis, including your title, your abstract, and a basic game plan for how you're gonna go through the year and write your thesis. And um, we worked together, both B-side and A-side, to come up with the basic outlines for our theses and sort of jump ideas off of each other for how to improve our um, abstracts. And we did like abstract speed dating where we taped our abstracts down and we all went around reading the different abstracts and writing comments. And this was with A-siders and B-siders. And I think one of the most valuable things from um, being Honors College in general and from that was getting the opinions from both people on A side and B side. And people from B side would be asking all these questions about, I can't think of an example, but they'd be asking like really interesting questions about the research that I was doing, but like I had never thought of before. And I think it's their different perspective that really brought in um, a new view. And I think hopefully the A siders had some interesting things to say for the projects that were going on on the B side. And that's one of the better examples I can think of in terms of the two different sides um, sort of working together and providing different points of view. One of the things that we, several of my friends would talk about was um, sort of bioethics behind, or there's like a bioethics class through human biology. And several of my friends were like really interested in the bioethics aspect of, um, or that's like surrounds research and different medical technologies and treatments and decisions. Um, and I was more interested in it from the perspective of stem cells and development, not surprisingly. Um, but this sort of, we had a lot of interesting conversations about bioethics and in particular surrounding stem cells and using embryos for research. And this brought in different aspects of religion and culture and um, sort of own, your own personal beliefs that made for interesting conversations and didn't always end in an agreement, but allowed us both, or both sides, to sort of further develop what our own beliefs based on other people's. Um, and I think this was sort of facilitated both by the classroom and by the fact that we had different backgrounds of um, academic classes from Stanford and human biology. And also um, in terms of the embryo, and using the embryo for research, it's a, it's a matter of, or one of the questions that came up was, you know, to what extent should the disease that we're hoping to treat be prevalent and um, sort of really negatively affecting people's lives to justify using and destroying embryos for research. And that was, that's brought up some really interesting conversations as well. So this is just what, if I'm talking to myself in 15 years, I think the curiosity in me would want to know what I did <laughs> before I do it. But um, I think I would tell myself to remember what it was like to not know, um, 
or should not feel completely confident in yourself and not knowing if you're asking the right questions. And um, to really make sure that you help out undergrads and maybe grad students who are interested in the same areas that you are and um, to really act as a, as a mentor to these people because I know that for me I haven't always been completely confident about my skills as a scientist or my academic skills but just talking to mentors and seeing that you know we were in the same place and we had no idea what we wanted to do or we didn't know what questions to ask either it's a learning process really helped me see that we're all people, we're all humans, we all started somewhere and we're all ending up somewhere else. And that has really helped me grow as a person and also to gain more confidence in myself and that I can, even if I can't do this now, I can do it later. And so I'd want my 15 year, myself in 15 years to still remember that and to help undergrads to, to see that too and to help them gain some confidence in their skills. So. Through human biology, I've become really interested in reproductive science and human developmental biology. And um, in my future, I'd really like to understand and further explore the unknown questions in these areas. And so for the next two years, I have concrete plans and I'll be working as a research technician in a laboratory at Penn. And the lab studies epigenetics or chromatin regulation. And I was interested in that mostly because it's sort of a necessary process that's involved in human development or development in general. Um, and so I was hoping to get a better understanding of how um, modifications of DNA and control of DNA um, influences development and um, cell fate. And so after that I'm hoping to apply to MD-PhD programs and um, sort of combine both the disease side and the basic science side of um, both fields and hopefully um, sort of explore human development and diseases that arise from, during human development and see what, what happens from there.